Hello, my name is Paul Anzalotti, and I'm here to present how to apply to Wharton's MBA program. Folks, this is session one of three. There'll be two more. I'll get to that in, a, in the next slide. But today, for this presentation, we're going to talk about, at a high level, the elements here, and then have a few moments for Q&A right at the end. The next two sessions, pretty much next week and the week after, today is more kind of the nitty gritty of the program in terms of getting to know it. Uh, the next session will be how to write a perfect Wharton application, perfect in quotes, of course. And then on June 3rd, the third session, we're gonna talk about what happens once you get the interview, otherwise known as the team-based discussion and how you would navigate that whole rigmarole. So before we get too far, how do I know what I'm talking about? Well, I've been doing this since about 2017. I've worked with over 600 candidates to top business schools and other professional programs. I've, when I worked at Veritas Prep, I managed all the admissions consultants and instructors in a former life. I was a GMAT instructor for Kaplan. So what's my point? My point is that I've seen pretty much every possible applicant scenario to any possible school out there. And that's where this advice comes from. And hopefully this presentation and my advice will be a lot more actionable and tactical than um, what you may find elsewhere on the internet. All right, so what do you really need to know about Wharton? And some of you already on this presentation may know about Wharton's good old knowledge for action mantra. Um, you kind of see knowledge for uh, plastered if you're at Wharton's campus, you'll see it plastered uh, quite a few places. But when you look at their website, you'll definitely see uh, that there are a lot of uh, references to, to, to this, right? Knowledge for. So what does this mean, right? And I, I pulled a quote from somewhere on Wharton's website. At the core of all programming is an opportunity to test, reflect, learn, and apply the intellectual foundations of accomplished faculty. Okay, why did I call out that quote? Because Wharton basically believes you know, when compared to all the other top business schools, including Stanford and Harvard, that, um, you know, it's, their differentiation is in their thought leadership and faculty research, right? They believe basically that they offer their students and whoever else is a part of the Wharton community a superior experience because of, um, because of, they place so much prominent prominence on basically R&D and the development of their faculty, right? And that'll translate into uh, better management knowledge and intellectual capital and frankly a better learning experience and a cutting edge innovative learning experience uh, for its students. So um, beyond that um, you can see this whole emphasis on intellectual prominence um, or you know having the best knowledge out there uh, emphasized in a really pragmatic way at Wharton. So you'll see that in and out of the classroom, they have a lot of, and this is where the action, you know, knowledge, this is the four action part, right? You'll see that, you know, whether it's global modular courses, um, whether it's, uh, you know, other global travel abroad, hands-on, in the weeds type experiences, uh, things like lifelong learning, things like preterm, all of these things at Wharton are meant to translate all of that intellectual prominence or dominance that they've developed with their faculty in, in the classroom or through research into tangible results. So uh, Wharton basically says that they are a thought leader because they kind of break down the barriers or bridge the gap between higher learning, you know, academia and real world business leadership and execution, right? These are all things that Wharton says, not things that I'm making up, right? But these are all things that I know to be true based on my experience. So again, this is very high level. Um, you wanna go into this whole application process with Wharton knowing that that's what, um, you know, basically that that's how the school views themselves. It, remember, when in doubt, always try to view the school as it views itself, try to view things as the admissions committee would view them. And you'll be able to, you'll be able to start figuring out what it is they're looking for when they ask you essay questions, which is what we're gonna cover in the next session. But here, we're building a foundation of that knowledge. All right, another thing that's closely related to knowledge for or knowledge for action at Wharton is this whole idea of collaborative innovation. And 
you know, it's 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 kind of the sister, the brother of the knowledge for. So basically, um, building upon some of the points that I made before is that they, you know, you see that this idea of innovation and collaboration is pretty much emphasized across, well, it is emphasized across all majors and departments at Wharton, right? And again, this innovation is that cutting edge resource or research and resources that the faculty provides. You can see it through their centers. Um, so, you know, they're, they're positioning. So what, what's its value to you, this knowledge for collaborative innovation? Basically, um, as a theme within your essays or the interview or wherever, when you're speaking with somebody at Wharton or about Wharton, you know, if you miss this whole collaborative innovation theme, if you miss this whole knowledge for action theme, you kind of look like you have your, you know, head stuck in the sand a little bit. Um, now, again, these are things that the school is emphasizing, the things that they push forward in their marketing material. They have done this for a long time. Um, and I know, you know, some of the cynics here may say, well, is this actually true? Uh, don't all schools say this? I hear that a lot. Listen, whether it, or not it's true, okay, yeah, sure, I guess it's up for debate, but the debate is not necessarily relevant in this regard when we're applying to business schools. If this is the way the school views themselves, we must accept it. And when we're writing about why Wharton in the first essay, which is a goals essay for Wharton and traditionally second essay has been, what do you bring to the table at Wharton? Something like that. We have to hit on those points as being Wharton's differentiator and also how you align and why you need an innovative, collaborative uh, uh, knowledge for action type program. All right, anyway, so it is what it is basically. Um, anyway, so it's the overarching philosophical lens by which we should approach Y Wharton when researching the school, when talking about the school, and when writing the essays. All right, a few other things here. Um, new directions for Wharton. All right, so I include a lot of links in this presentation because, frankly, um, well, frankly, because there is there's basically so much content that we could cover in this presentation. I mean, down to individual courses and classes that we'd be here a month full of Sundays, as they say. So anyway, so click on these links to watch these videos, to go over the um, the documents that I, that I have provided, right? And a lot of these documents are, well, all of them are sourced from Wharton's website, more or less, right? So you can see the primary source research here. All right, so new direction for Wharton. Um, in the past, just very briefly, first bullet point, Dean Robertson, good old former Dean Robinson, he, he Robertson, he came up with these three pillars, right? And he emphasized innovation being the most important pillar. And that's, of course, which is partly my opinion, but if you look at the way the curriculum is structured and what they've emphasized in the past, it's what it is, right? Out of all the three kind of global pillar, I think there was a social innovation pillar or there was a social good pillar and then there was a uh, innovation pillar. So anyway, then along came um, Dean Garrett, Dean Jeffrey Garrett. And, you know, he, all deans want to leave their mark on a school and these things are important to know because um, you want to play to the band a little bit when applying and I'll get into that more in a second. But he had an interview with a, uh, the Wall Street Journal, right? And I was reading that interview. And you know what struck a chord with me was Dean Garrett's emphasis on public-private partnerships. Now, this is a few years ago, right? So I'm giving you a little bit of a history lesson here. But it shows a little bit how things change and a little bit this slide in the next and how things more or less stay the same. But when the Wall Street Journal asked Dean Garrett, hey, what are your priorities for the school? Of course, he's going to do a serious review of the undergraduate program and, okay, perhaps the MBA program as well. But what, um, you know, what's notable here is the new public policy initiative. And that doesn't just affect the undergraduate program, that significantly affected the graduate program as well. And you'll see a, new classes being introduced. You'll see, um, you know, new research from professors. Uh, like I said, the whole knowledge fraction thing, uh, you know, even new, um, you know, emphasis in, in through its centers, right? So um, anyway, so here you can see that Wharton starts to emphasize that. So anybody here who's applying from the nonprofit or a non-traditional background or, you know, whatever industry you may come from, if your short and long-term goals ultimately are to save the whales or bring running water to every village in Canada, um, 
you know, just know that you might have a home at Wharton. Why is that? Because, um, you know, even though Wharton has always been known as a quote finance school, unquote, uh, there is room for everybody on, on the bus more or less, right? Uh, even if the majority of the seats are consumed by your finance types. Anyway, so uh, just to give you a little bit more of a history lesson here with the public uh, policy initiative, it, it all stems off of these whole public private partnerships um, emphasis that is emerging or has been emerging or has emerged within the business world and the, the therefore the business school MBA world. Um, you know, increase, look at the Venn diagram, public over here, private over here. Let's increase the overlap between the two type thing and use private sector solutions and frameworks to solve the problems affecting society through public private partnerships, right? And I put some links down here um, that where you can, you know, watch all these great YouTube presentations. But another thing that he uh, emphasized uh, in these videos, um, back in the day here and something that's still very much the, the reason i bring these things up is because they're still relevant at the school today right uh beyond a history lesson is because garrett dean garrett former dean garrett also called out um this kind of renewed or or reinvigorated emphasis on data analytics and data driven decision making right so um that's kind of his emphasis so listen wharton is always going to be strong in finance Dean Garrett knows that. Any other dean, you know, new dean Erica James knows that as well, right? Um, but you know, they need to, you know, they want to diversify a bit. They need to diversify a bit. They want to attract a wider base. So they've gotten into the whole big data game, right? And again, this is a few years back. Big data. The the emphasis on that is not uh, certainly not new, but but it is there, um, and it is something that Dean Garrett um, was initially um, building his legacy upon when he first got to the school. Now. Um, and then, I, you know, I, I put some other, put some other things in here about public private partnerships, go to the YouTubes, right? Watch that. Um, and <laughs> post a message in the comments, I suppose. All right. Uh, new, here, continuing on with new directions for Wharton, right? Um, I also, you know, here continuing on third bullet point, the finance school and so much more. So there's a couple of articles that I link to here about um, Wharton very much being a finance school. And, you know, this was, these were articles that popped up in Wharton Magazine, I believe, right towards the end of his tenure, right before he's about to hand the reins off to um, new Dean Erica James, right? So um, what do you need to know about these, these, these articles or these emphasis? So he kind of reflects on his tenure, of course, and he identifies, you know, really three themes that are going to uh, call out, the, you know, that affect the, the future, right? And so, you know, beyond, you know, data and analytics, innovation and entrepreneurship, if you go through here and reading about the future of finance and the school's bright future, right? Because of course he he left uh, the school better than he found it. And, and I do believe that to be honest with you. He talks about the role of more or less, um, fintech you know finance technology he talks about um you know more or less um using the power of business of course to affect positive social change um and he just talks you know the, the main emphasis here is basically the the synergy right for lack of a better word uh the marriage between financial you know finance and technology and how that's revolutionizing the world how it's going to bring in you know 800 million unbanked from south asia things like that, right? So take a look and just know that as of last year, middle of last year, summer, when you know he was leaving, this is the state of the union, more or less, the state of the school in these two, these two links, right? All right. Um, yeah, and of course, you know, calls out data and analytics, innovation and entrepreneurship, we get all that. All right, so now, Dean Erica James, new Dean, Erica James, right? Uh, she came from Emory Goizuda um, and has been in the seat, what, for maybe about a year, well, a little less than a year now. Uh, probably been some interesting times for her given the COVID crisis, but uh, put some links in here with respect to the whole, um, uh, you know, what's she all about, what she gonna do. Now, in all fairness to Dean James, you know, every, in all respect, 
every dean wants to come in and leave their mark, right? They want to leave their footprint. I mean, at least on the way out anyway, right? So, but what I've observed personally, you know, since 2007, more or less doing this, is that the deans will come in, give a bunch of interviews, you know, tell about what their plans are, you know, ask a bunch of questions about what they plan to do, yada, yada. But what her imprint is thus far remains to be seen, right? And that's not a slam on her or anything, no, no disrespect. Um, it's what I see most of the time with new deans, but she's probably just getting settled in more or less, right? So look for new specializations, courses, research centers, you know, tweaks to the mission statement, hell, maybe even uh, changes to knowledge for action, right? Or, you know, collaborative innovation, who knows? But um, my main point is that the more things supposedly change with new deans in their imprint, uh, the more things stay the same, right? So uh, every few years, every 10 years, sometimes 15, maybe even 20, but every five to 10 years, you'll see that top MBA programs, for the most part, they'll have some fairly major curriculum revisions, right? It's it's more once in a blue moon than than every year, right? And, um, you know, those, those that, that, that hasn't changed probably since Dean uh, Robertson was there where Wharton had a major overhaul, right? Um, so my point is this, the more things change, the more, th you know, supposedly change, the more they stay the same. So even if you're looking at older documents or resources or speaking with, you know, alumni who graduated a few years ago, <clears throat> their knowledge should be relevant, right? Uh, for your research into Wharton. And, um, you know, you, you know, follow the money, follow the the resources and their allocation. If you see them being poured in new courses in one area or another, a new center for XYZ, then you know that the school is pretty much um, going in that direction. I and mean, this is beyond reading and watching interviews and things like that. Uh, but make no mistake about it. In my opinion, you know, Wharton still is the finance school. Um, and I, you know, I, I don't think that's anything they should try to avoid or be ashamed of or whatever. And it's not, it's not that they are, but they are trying to diversify, right? So that being said, keep in mind, again, if you are a non-traditional, if you're not from finance, if you have, want to have nothing to do with finance, that they are looking for you. Now, this is, you know, more of a kind of a uh, observation that I've seen. So maybe anecdotal, let's say. What I've seen is that, you know, Clients, applicants, people that I talk to um, who are applying to business school, they'll say, well, I don't want to apply to Wharton or even Booth or some financy school because they're not in the finance. And I will say, you know, that is probably a mistake to assume that because Wharton, um, without a doubt, will receive plenty of applications from financy people, right? Whatever industry within finance, from the entrepreneurial VC to, you know, investment banking. And um, they will have that silo full. Uh, but you also have to recognize that uh, as an applicant, the admissions committee has many silos, some bigger than others, of course, maybe finance is still the biggest, but there will be a home for you if you work for, let's say Gates Foundation, or you work for the government of India or whoever, right? Um, there will be a place for you and chances are like, listen, Harvard, Stanford, Wharton, there's plenty of people applying. There'll be plenty of people. They're not hurting for applicants, right? But just, so my point is just because a school is finance oriented, don't take your hat out of the ring. Go look if they have the classes, courses, uh, you know, part of a curriculum that will give you what you need, then for sure, um, for sure you should, you should apply right out. Of course you have to have the right stats and the right pedigree and, you know, solid leadership work experience, things like that. But, but go for it. All right. So, um, all right. Anyway, uh, and, and, and here's the other thing right here at the end, these, you know, second to last bullet point. If you see that a school's moving in a certain direction, like Wharton, you know, with some of the themes I just gave you, public private policy, or, you know, with uh, data analytics, big data, um, with whatever may be emerging, then what I would say is you definitely want to or need to, um, capitalize on that within your essays if it's appropriate so don't force it right but if you have that background it should be encouraging write about it right um and you know thinking ahead to the goals here so next week 
Um, you know, your goals should always be conservative, especially your short term goal. Um, your goals, you know, maybe a little more aspirational for your long term goals. But basically what it comes down to is that um, you you if you have enough courses and clubs and things that you can get involved in to write about over both essays, then yes, you should apply. OK, I probably beat that horse to death. All right, moving on. Now, uh, hopefully I can display this guide here because I have it up in a separate window. Um, I'm not sure if I can here, but anyway, um, perhaps I should have pasted, cut and pasted. But if not, I'll, you'll just have to follow along and use your imagination. All right. So the first thing that everyone, I believe, I mean, one of the first things that everyone should get out of this presentation and be looking at after this presentation is over is this thing called, um, you know, Wharton's MBA resource guide, right? And it's a PDF. Um, you know, I, I, I link to it here. Uh, but really what this is, is this is an all, and I don't think for some reason, I'm not uh, technically astute enough to, to pull this up, but basically this is a monster PDF. It's probably the most valuable resource for you as you explore Wharton. Um, I'm not sure how many pages it has, but it might be 75, 80. And it goes through, it's it's not meant for external distribution, I believe, whatever, but it is on their website. And it pretty much gives you a rundown at all options to plan your MBA academic program at Wharton. Now, do you have to read all 75 pages? Certainly not. Do you have to read the description for every course um, or project or department that's on there? Well, no. Right. But as you go through this PDF, you know, you don't have to peruse all of it. Maybe just a scan. But, you know, when you when you're thinking about why Wharton. Right. And OK. Yeah. Paul, knowledge fraction. I get it. Collaborative innovation. I get it. Yeah. 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 Right. Um, I'm a finance guy or maybe I'm a, you know, a consulting gal, whatever. You know, I get all that touchy feely, nice stuff, marketing stuff. But really, you know, what do I need to know about Wharton? This is where it begins to get. Um, very real right so this you know if, if if listen you go through this document it will spell out to you in nauseating detail all the different majors and at wharton it's very important to know what major you're going to be a part of you can basically declare up to two but when you start to go through and read through this resource guide and you look at all 75 pages or whatever it is what you want to do is you know you need to know going into it kind of what your goals are, perhaps, even if they're not completely formulated, um, but a general area, finance, consulting, whatever, marketing, and go to that section or that major within the guide, right? And read every single class that's in there. And, you know, you'll start to pick up on nuances. Like there is a more or less a general management major, right? But within that general management major, for example, you'll have entrepreneurial, um, you know, management, um, you'll have a few other flavors of it as well, right? And um, you'll begin to understand some of the nuances of the program, the Wharton program that you won't necessarily get from just reading the website, right? Um, maybe you'd have to talk to a bunch of students, but you know, within the, the, the what's so great about Wharton's you know, management major, more or less, it allows you to have kind of these sub majors within it um, that you know, some more international, some more entrepreneurial, some more operations focused, whatever it may be, but it kind of gives you a little bit more of a management buffet, I guess, of picking classes, right? Um, and then of course there's other, you know, more analytical, well, more, um, you know, like a like a, there's a risk management related major, for example. So if that's your goal, you have a perfect major right there, right? So just know when you read through this, you begin to pick up nuances with, you know, what's a FAP, you know, an FAP, uh, you, <clears throat> excuse me, a field action project. So, um, you know, it, it's, it's, God, I wish I could pull it up right now, but it is basically the gateway into knowing everything about, about Wharton, right? And so the way you would approach this guide without having it pulled up in front of everybody is you hit control F and look like, so if you want to, you know, um, work for a nonprofit or something in the long term or short term, you're going to go work for the Bill and Melinda Gates, or maybe it's just the Gates Foundation. Now, um, you would just hit control F and you search through it and you'd see, you know, what type of uh, social finance or social sector initiatives they may have. And look, of course, to see under what majors they fall under. And I have had this, <clears throat> excuse me, scenario in the past where you basically, um, 
you know, a, an individual, individuals, applicants, clients, they thought that their major would definitely be within one area of finance, right? And they were coming from finance. But what they realized was that most of their electives that they would really need, and again, this is why I say you have to think about your goals, you have to think about what you know, and then kind of see where the gap is. Well, you go through and you're basically saying, or you're basically looking for, okay, the gaps that I have in operations or, you know, in HR or marketing or whatever this person may have had, go through, hit control F, try to find those classes or find those classes in this resource guide. Um, and those classes may actually not be in the finance major or anything related to it, right? So you may have to pick two majors, of, of course, which is totally appropriate, but just know, a lot of people go into this exercise thinking, okay, I'm a finance major. I kind of have finance goals in the long term. Of course, I want to say, you know, I, was a, I, was a, I come from a finance professional background. I may have more finance oriented goals. Maybe that's half of it. But the things that they already need to learn to reach their finance goals after Wharton, they already have. So there's all these other areas. We'll hit control F, look through the guide. If it's HR, if it's operations, if it's whatever, then, um, and it falls under, I don't know, human resources oriented or operations oriented um, major, well, then that should tell you something. So don't force fit the finance major because you have finance goals and you maybe have a finance background. Start looking to see, start identifying where your areas of need are uh, and then look for those classes, see what majors they go under. Now, how do you know what your needs are gonna be? Well, that's a pretty simple exercise, by the way, not to get too far off track here, but you basically go and find the job description on LinkedIn or indeed.com or whatever. And, you know, if you want to be an analyst in some firm somewhere, go look, hopefully they recruit at Wharton. That's key. Look at the job description, then assess, okay, what do you know right now based on what you've experienced as a professional? You see your future post MBA role, you see the job description for it. Okay. You see, you know, they're looking for one, two, three, four, five. You have one, two, three. Therefore, what are you missing? the last two. So hopefully an MBA program for the love of God can solve or address or backfill that knowledge, right? Um, okay, so maybe it's, again, using this example, maybe it's more product knowledge, product development knowledge. Maybe it's more, you know, organizational transformation or growth knowledge. Okay, we'll find those classes in this freaking 75 page resource guide that I'm not showing on the, the presentation right now. And go through, control F, see what majors they are, and try to start building a critical mass or a, a, a core of classes um, that you're gonna need. And again, always pay attention to what majors they fall under. And I think for a lot of you, no matter what your background is, you'll see that it starts to maybe coalesce under the management major. You'll see, because there's these sub majors within the management major, right? And you only know that by maybe reading this guide but you can start picking from the international ones and maybe the more entrepreneurial ones. And then there's, I think it's called, uh, uh, there's, there's one, um, I think it's like a multinational management or whatever it may be called, but you go through, okay. And you guys get it at this point, right? Okay. So that this thing will, this thing is like half the battle. If you remember the old GI Joe cartoons, maybe I'm dating myself anyway. So, um, what else? What else is this 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 guide good for? I mean, listen, there's a bunch of org charts, but it it gives you a synopsis or a listing of every research center and initiative, every specialized program. Um, okay, yeah, there's a code of ethics and things that are listed, but basically, you know, if you're going to tell Wharton that you want to go there in the first essay, your goals essay, which we will get to next week, you have to list out and be specific about the courses and clubs, majors that you want. Here's where you go now. This is a, a beginning step. So there is a synopsis of every, um, every basically every um, course offered right now at Wharton for the most part, right? And there's also things about, you know, dual degree programs, international programs, the old semester in San Francisco, AKA Wharton West. So you start to notice things when you go through here, like what is semester in San Francisco? Oh, that's Wharton West, whatever, right? I didn't even know they had that. You'll start knowing about things like math for business, right? Preterm, uh, clusters and cohorts, whatever, you know, the core, the fact that you can get a waiver, all that stuff. All right. So um, anyway, all right. So that's as you go. So this is invaluable. Now, here's the thing, by the way, um, without getting too far into ne next week's presentation, but when you find your gaps and you find the courses that address your gaps, and of course, the major, you want to go through and 
Google the name of that course, because don't just read the synopsis and think you're done, by the way, right? Uh, with respect to, you know, Wharton's curriculum, go Google the name of that course in quotes and, you know, PDF, right? Or in Google, you can Google the name of the course in quotes and then file type colon PDF and see what PDFs come up. There will be one um, for that course, right? And read through that entire uh, syllabus. Um, don't just take kind of the lazy person's way out and read the synopsis here in this document. This is just a gateway to knowing everything about, about, um, about Warden. All right, so um, moving down into some of the other bullet points. Now, right here, there's a link to, you know, let's say you're not into PDFs, totally get it. This is, um, you know, 2020. Here is the Wharton, this link right in the middle, smack dab in the middle of this page. That is the online catalog to all Wharton programs. You can get on there and peruse, right? A um, few other guides that I, that I um, saw fit to link to here. There's a let's get started guide. Yeah, you know, basically about uh, every all the fun, oh, the fun you're going to have and the places you're going to go um, once you hit the ground running at, at Wharton, right? And then there's a few other, you know, PDFs, PowerPoints, and things like that with the international opportunities. And again, I don't mean to, um, I don't mean to undersell Wharton's global reach. That's certainly a part of it. Certainly something you can reference or maybe even should reference, depending on what your goals are in your essays, right? Or in any conversation you have with an admissions committee member or alumni or student. But here, um, this, you know, what is the second to last bullet point? This is a chart that tells you about all the international opportunities very nicely laid out. Um, so, you know, instead of kind of mining the whole website, the best thing to do is try to find some of these PDFs, look at them. It, it cuts out a lot of the, um, you know, a lot of a lot of the garbage and the noise, right? The the salesman marketing material. Look at the PDF. So it gives you a grid of the opportunities. Very nice, right? Um, now, by the way, when you're looking through these documents, if some of them that I link to you are a few years old, right? Because I may not be able to find the most recent ones, or you may not be able to find the most recent ones. Okay, just assume it's mostly accurate, but always go through and try to find a more updated document, of course. But check the current or the present Wharton website by simply Googling the name of the course or the club or the initiative or whatever, you know, leadership training program to see if it's still there, right? So for example, Dean Robertson, good old Dean Robertson from back in the, Robertson from back in the day, three pillars, right? Um, that was his whole program, the three pillars. That's, that's how he wanted, um, you know, Wharton to be viewed as through that lens. Now, if you go look and for years they had that. And then if, you know, all of a sudden when Dean Garrett came around, all of a sudden three pillars disappeared, right? And, you know, if you're still stuck in the Dean Robertson world uh, and you didn't get with the program with Dean Garrett, um, you, and you said that in your, you wrote that in your, your essay about three pillars you reference that, you know, listen, it wouldn't kill your essay, but because the school's essentially the same, but you do look like, you know, your last year's, you know, wardrobe, right? Slightly out of style. So you would go and again, check all this stuff, right? It's up to you. I can hand you this stuff, but you got to check it too. A uh, trust, but verify. And you'd go through and just Google three pillars. And you see that is pretty much nowhere on the Wharton website anymore. Maybe there's some stale pages, you know, the the web admin forgot to scrub, and then, you know, those corners, but it's, it's basically gone. Anyway, and then, you know, okay, it's gone. It's gone for a reason. Don't reference it. Um, also because Paul said not to reference it. Uh, and then, so anyway, getting back to the second to last bullet point, there's a ton of international opportunities. It's it's really a part of, you know, Wharton's, it's deeply embedded in Wharton's DNA. It's certainly part of the knowledge for action mantra, as I mentioned earlier, um, uh, because, you know, you get your hands dirty, yada, yada. Uh, and, you know, it, it is uh, <laughs> Dean Roberts, one of Dean Robertson's three pillars, uh, which isn't referenced anymore. But as you can see, the more things change, the more they stay the same, it's still there uh, as represented through all of these options, which are nicely summarized through this link. Now, the last bullet point here with respect to um, Wharton's curriculum is this leadership development aspect. So when you're go, okay, just real quick here, when you're going and you're applying to a program, the deal is, is that, you know, you're going to state your goals in the first essay and second essay, you're kind of going to state what you want to get involved in and what you bring to the community. Okay. But when you're going through the first essay, and again, we'll cover a bit of this next week, so I'm foreshadowing here, I suppose. You want to be able to say, here are my goals. 
here are my gaps. Here is how Wharton fills those gaps. Now, the here are my gaps. Remember, I mentioned a few minutes ago that you can get on LinkedIn, find the job description, see what you know now, see what gaps you have, and can the Wharton MBA fill that? If it can, okay, search through this whole MBA resource guide, you know the drill. Um, but the other aspect of that is not only the management knowledge you're going to need to, to fill your gaps, you know, or plug your gaps or bridge your gaps. Um, but the other aspect of what you're going to need to learn is leadership development. So, you know, management, okay, I guess that's more of like the nuts and bolts, but leadership is more of dealing with ambiguity and uncertainty and getting other people who may be opposed to march in the direction to realize some great big goal, whether it's in your short term or long term. So you need all the management knowledge to make things run, you know, make the car run, but ultimately you still need that strategic roadmap to take the car somewhere. You know, I don't know if that's the greatest analogy or the most confusing analogy possible, but but it's the one I just came up with. So the executive coaching and feedback program is like this 360 degree initiative. Um, and it's meant to, you know, view you and your leadership and your approach uh, and your soft skills from, well, 360 degrees, right? So you get evaluated holistically, you get bottoms up and top down feedback, yada, yada. And the idea is that you basically get torn down to your bare elements and exposed and, you know, and made aware of these weaknesses so you can build them back up. Okay, great. That's summarized in this executive coaching and feedback program document from Wharton, right? Um, but that is, you know, that that's why this is here, right? I'm, there's a ton of PDFs and material and presentations Wharton's given over the years, but here is kind of everything I think in one page um, that you should know or need to know. Um, just to get started on reading this. So before our next presentation, go through all of these. Um, you know, if, if, if something's confusing, sure, you know, email me, right? No problem. Um, but anyway, so that's kind of your homework for next week before we start getting in the essays. Anyway, before I get too far down that, that rabbit hole. So, all right, what else with respect to the tactical aspects of the Wharton's curriculum? Well, again, you know, not to beat a dead horse, let, don't go into it thinking, I know what my major is going to be. You'll be surprised. Read through that whole MBA resource planning guide, right? And again, consider what you need to learn and then what part of the curriculum those classes are. Okay. That should be your major. You can take two majors, as I said. And again, um, looks like I, I preempted the slide by talking about this too much, but again, use Google to find the syllabus, read through the whole freaking, um, document, right? And and why is that important? Not just because Paul said so, but when you go to write your essays, which again, will be covered next week, you'll know, you, you don't, you don't just want to say, listen, I have these gaps, you know, dear Wharton, I have these gaps. Here are my goals. I have these gaps. Here are the classes and clubs and centers and, you know, professors that would backfill that knowledge. You don't just want to say, you, just, you don't want to start laundry listing. You want to pick a few classes, fewer classes, one class for each gap that you may have. Let's say you have three gaps that you've identified and you want to dive deeper into each one of those classes. That's why you read the whole syllabus, right? So you actually know what the hell you're talking about. But those reading the, the PDF syllabuses when you're researching Wharton's uh, curriculum, that's what guides what you write in your essay. So, you know, if you say I have a lack, you know, um, operations management expertise, or product management expertise, and that's the direction I want to go building off of my, whatever, finance skills. Um, when you go through and you find the product management classes, and then you Google and you find the whole PDF uh, syllabus for that that class, um, you read through and you see what is being done every week, every day. You see how it's created, of course, but there will be a, you know, a, a more in-depth, I guess, summary or synopsis for that class. And it tells you the learning objectives are this. When you take this class, you will emerge stronger and smarter, of course, but you will have this type of knowledge. And in the process over these 16 weeks or however long the class is, every week, someone, an alumni or a, an expert from industry comes in to give that lecture. You know, maybe it's all case-based, whatever it may be. But you start seeing tactically how you're going to learn and also, you know, how hands-on knowledge is. You see all that, you know, marketing BS, you know, quote unquote, and I, I say that, you know, in a lighthearted way, but all that stuff that Wharton advertises, you start to see here when you read the syllabus. Oh, I see how knowledge traction isn't BS. Wait a second. I see how it's tactically being translated. They have an expert or an alumni or somebody from industry come in every week to present 
the very case that we're studying, right? And, and you know, you see how they're bridging the gap between the, weir, you know, academia and the real world, as I said a few slides ago, many slides ago, probably. But um, so you see how, you know, the reason I started off this presentation with knowledge traction and some of that marketing stuff where everybody may be, or some people may be rolling their eyes and saying, geez, okay, Paul, you know, tell me something I don't know. Well, you see how it where rubber meets the road here, right? Just wanted to point that out because I don't want to tell you anything that's not relevant. Um, anyway, so you see how, you know, the funnel works. There's this big, grand knowledge fraction, collaborative innovation, and it starts to whittle down. And then finally, you're on the Google and you're looking for the name of the classroom and you're finding that PDF syllabus and you're reading through it and you're like, oh, damn, now I know how knowledge translates into action. Okay, so, um, all right. There you go. And then and then you use the specifics of the class in, so getting back to the point I was making, right? You use the specifics of that class that you read in the PDF syllabus, most likely a PDF, right? Um, and you say, okay, I need to, I need more, you know, product management knowledge, right? Product development knowledge. Um, you find out what you're gonna learn in that class and how you're gonna learn it. And you would say, so you have this gap in the essay, I need more product development knowledge because I'm gonna be a product manager. And then through, Product Development 605 with Professor Singh, right? Um, I am going to learn about, and then you put in what you learned from the syllabus, right? I, I don't know if this is painfully tactical uh, or didactic, uh, but you put in there, you know, and and through by by learning directly from, you know, industry experts who come into class every week to present the case, I will, you know, I see how knowledge for action um, you know, manifests in the, you know, in the real world classroom at, at uh, Wharton, right? And then you move on to the next gap that you need to plug and, you know, from by reading the next syllabus or, you know, whatever else part of the curriculum, right? You see how it works, huh? Magic. All right. Wait, wait, wait. So not done yet on this slide, slide 11. All right. So the other thing too, and I want you to also do this before next week. That's why I kind of slugged it in here towards the end, which is, um, everyone here right go see if who is being hired from wharton right now try to find a critical mass right so maybe you're you come from a non-traditional background and whatever look at the you know and so maybe there's not a lot of people going from the coast guard into finance or whatever fine okay we understand right but go and look to see who what companies are hiring their names their locations right try to find out who they were hiring. Now, how do you find out who they were hiring? Ha ha, and I have another presentation about this, my friends, on YouTube somewhere, I believe, uh, in the GMAC Club channel, about using LinkedIn to determine what your goals should be, right? So you go through, you find a profile of the person who has, who graduated from Wharton, hopefully, or some other top MBA program, who has the job that you want, right? Now remember, <laughs> so you're going after their job, right? Kidding. but. Basically, find that future version of yourself in that role. Okay, yeah, see what the requirements are and all that stuff. But I want you to go try to find three, four, five, 50 profiles like that from Wharton, from Wharton. See if you can identify a trend with the name of the company. Um, you know, are they recently hiring? Are they not? You know, what industries are coming to campus? So start with this link here with the career stati statistics. Okay, they hired, Amazon hired 15 people for their leadership development product management program. Okay, cool. I can see myself doing that. I think that's actually a pretty good goal now, right? And so you start dialing in the specifics and then you go and you basically, um, once you have those specifics kind of dialed in, you come back and you're basically like, all right, what am I gonna do in that program? I can tell Wharton that's what my goal is. I see there's a critical mass. I understand where my gaps are. Bada bing, bada boom, right? So, um, so that's it, right? Now, so don't, okay. And what is this meant to avoid? by doing it early, you'll know if you have just completely unrealistic goals. I know a lot of people have been thinking about goals uh, and am I a fit for Wharton, right? Well, this should tell you. If you don't find anybody who wants to join the circus post MBA or become a rodeo clown post MBA, that should tell you something, right? Um, now, the other thing too is when you do find that future job and that future profile, the pro forma version of you post MBA, um, look to see what their pedigree is, right? So if you're from India, are they from India, right? If you're from investment banking, are they from investment banking? Just to see how you stack up. Did they go to a top school 
uh, which ones, right? What was their major? Things like that. Um, just try to, you know, measure up. Anyway, all right, and that way you determine whether or not Warden is actually a place where you want to apply, right? Because the one thing that's worth mentioning right now is that the admissions committee very much at Wharton looks at your short-term goals. They over, based on my experience, overwhelming emphasis on your short-term goals and whether or not you can achieve those goals. They want to know if you are um, the best fit for that, right? So career changes, don't do it, right? I mean, some people have to change careers. If you might say you're an engineer, you know, and you've been holed up in some factory somewhere like I was in a former life, okay, you, it, you have to by, by definition. Military, sure. If you're a professional volleyball player, sure. But um, beyond that, try to be as conservative as possible. And next week, we'll get into transferable skills and all that stuff. So, you know, making that jump. But just find the job that you want on LinkedIn right now. Uh, and then you can start working backwards to the gaps that you have. And then you can start working even backwards, you know, reverse engineering all the way to this, you know, MBA resource guide. And then you can find those courses and you can, again, use the Googs, the Google to find the PDF syllabus, read through it. Boom, you have like the last part of your goals uh, essay written for the most part. I, I joke, it's more complicated than that, but but um, at least you know what you're talking about and if Wharton can help you, right? All right, let's see, I beat that horse to death. And if you, and, hey, listen, if necessary, by the way, last bullet point worth mentioning again, listen, if you have to rescope your goals or change your goals, do it right? Because the last thing the admissions committee wants to see, remember I said overwhelming emphasis on short-term goals, are goals that they, it's like, why am I reading this application? We like her, we like him, everything looks great. But then you have these, excuse my French here, batshit crazy goals that they can't help you with, right? Uh, I mean, are they even goals, right? So, so don't make their job harder. Just go with the flow, go with what you can do. If you thought, you know, you wanted to be a circus clown, and no circus is ever recruited for circus clowns at um, at Wharton. Well, then change it to something else, right? You want to go work for whatever, you know, in the management of a circus or something. You, you guys get it, right? I kind of kidding with that last point or last example, but you guys get it. All right. The other thing too, especially for internationals, and we'll get to this next week in 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 all its glory. Consider a backup goal, a backup plan, right? Actually, a backup plan. Um, is what that meant, um, which could be a backup plane. Anyway, so um, consider what else you could do. And that's even more of a conservative goal. Again, don't worry about that for now. We will just worry about finding a couple of roles that you can do in the short term. Okay, moving on, because I think we're running shorter on time. Um, all right. So again, here's a link to some of these Let's Get Started presentations. You can see that some of these documents are a little older. But that's why I always try to Google to find the most recent one. These are the most recent ones that I could find, right? But go through your, your Google foo may be better than mine. Um, so academic affairs introduction, core curriculum majors, all this stuff. Um, so this is a different set of documents. So whenever you find one, don't think that is the holy grail of documents, even though I told you the MBA resource guide is, it pretty much is, always go back and double check through some other corroborate through another you know, PDF or document or web page on the website. Um, all right, preterm is a big thing. You know, it's like storming, norming, forming type thing where you meet all your your besties for the next two years uh, or not. Um, and then here's some more on the semester in San Francisco, which is really popular with those who like San Francisco. You know, really popular with those, um, you know, the tech, the techies, right? Even if you're not a techie, you can make the argument that you need to spend a semester in San Francisco. It's beautiful that time of year uh, because you hate snow, but really because you may need more of an element. So, autom so again, this is one of these things where, like I said before, people assume that they're in tech. So they, of course, they have to go to the Bay Area, San Francisco. But really, even if you're, you know, coming from a, you know, you know whatever type of, um, so social um, uh, welfare institution, right, or or some type of nonprofit. Um, you can make the argument that you haven't had exposure to all of the techie stuff. You need to build that part of your network. And therefore, semester in San Francisco is a good option, right? So I don't think you have to have, you know, invented the online version of sliced bread to, to engage these types of things. Um, and then just, you know, and you'll see this once you start reading through these documents, Wharton has a ton of electives, right? Isn't that, that's very specific, right? A ton of electives, perhaps more than any other top program. I couldn't find 
um, or corroborate that, but I left it in anyway. Uh, but based on my experience, I mean, this school is insane. Uh, let me be honest with you, you know, kind of in summary here with Wharton, because the next slide is, is um, you know, my contact information. But listen, out of all the top business schools, right? Um, and this is just personal sidebar here. You know, I personally feel that Wharton is the one making the most moves, right? They're, they're very, very astute. And I'll, and I'll uh, give a couple of examples. I think the first example is we all know that Wharton, you know, I believe was ranked number one in some of these rankings. Now, do I personally believe they're a better program than, you know, Stanford or Harvard? Well, I would just say it's HSW for a reason, right? Um, and, and I would say that, you know, it's not on my own anecdotal, well, actually statistically significant um, experience here because I probably worked with over 600 people over the years. You know, so, you know, Wharton is not nearly as hard as Harvard and Stanford to get into. Um, now, that's not saying everything about the quality of education because um, Wharton does a very good job managing its reputation, managing its branding, its presentation. I think it does a very good job managing the rankings, right? And becoming first. Um, uh, but so, so I like that about the program. Not, not, I'm not saying they're gaming the rankings or anything, like that, but I like the fact that they're very focused on what needs to be done and, and they do it. So yes, there's a lot of theory and, you know, uh, subject matter expertise developed in the classroom because they pour a ton of money into faculty development and subject matter expertise development. Okay. But I like the fact that uh, the program seems to be very organized and very well run, right? And I'm not saying that Harvard, Stanford, and any other program, you know, they aren't. What I'm saying is that Wharton is as sharp as a knife, right? In terms of the people who run it, in my opinion, based on what I've seen from their admissions committee and a lot of the other programs that they have. They also are doing some cool, for lack of a better term, shit, right? Um, you know, there's this, this tangent hall Right, which is uh, something that's uh, already completed, I would imagine. Um, and it's a building on campus, the you know University of Pennsylvania campus, where it's basically a hub for startups. You have to have a startup project to go there. You you have to be in a project team where you're teaming with somebody from the School of Engineering, the School of Design, right? And so beyond having all these electives, they really have a ton of not just hands-on stuff like travel abroad. We're going to go to you know, we're going to go to Jamaica and we're going to form a business plan. Okay, you can do all that. But they have a lot of cool uh, stuff that I think these, these types of innovation labs and, again, focus on innovation and collaborative innovation. They're not just saying that, you know, to, to, to fill up glossy marketing material. They actually put their money where their mouth is. They're investing a lot. So this whole tangent hall thing, I think, is a really great recent um, example of that, right? They have a whole building. And it's cool. They have stuff like a maker lab in there, um, if you know what that is, right? They even have ovens where you can bake cupcakes if you have a cupcake baking business. Um, but it's really cool, there's even a retail business on the first floor. Anyway, I probably sound like, you know, I have stock in Wharton, but I, I really, I'll give them credit, you know, out of all the all the programs, I feel like they are and have been the most innovative in the last few years. Anyway, so there you go. Uh, all right, I imagine if anyone's still on this presentation, that there will be some questions. Um, again, here's my contact information. If you have any questions, um, heaven forbid, if any of those links are broken, email me, I'll get you the documents. Oh my God, there are a ton of questions. So we're gonna go back up to the top. Um, all right, so uh, let's see here. All right. So Tanmay, Tanmay says at 9.29 a.m., why is there a different criteria for Indian applicants? Why do we have to score a higher GMAT score than our peers to be considered analytically equivalent? Wow, this is this is uh, a good question. This is, okay, so I'm gonna try to be as honest, straightforward and respectful always as possible. Um, and I see um, Drashti has chimed in and he or she is more or less correct, right? There, it's just hyper competitive. So, okay. Um, there is just a ton of insanely high test scores coming out of India. Um, when I look at this, is my own personal experience, looking at tons of resumes from applicants from India, I see incredible um, uh, pedigrees, incredible resumes, right? The things for, and I'll just, listen, I know some people roll their eyes here. I'm gonna pick on IIT here. But the things that a lot of these guys and gals have done in, 
three and a half, four years, you know, four and a half years at IIT, you know, I'm talking about everything from travel abroad to integrated uh, bachelor's, master's, and, you know, some type of tech or engineering or textiles. Um, the things that I see, it makes me wonder what the hell I was doing when I was an undergrad, right? Many moons ago. Um, but in all seriousness, the resumes are stacked. Um, I, you know, whatever's in the water over there uh, in, in South Asia, um, it is super competitive. You get these monster resumes, right? Just like a unit of a resume, right? Just a machine of a resume uh, in a good way. And you're just, you know, they, they, you just, listen, they have, these admissions committees will literally have 10 seats, 20 seats, however many seats carved out for applicants from India, South Asia, wherever, right? So that's who you're fighting against. And, you know, it's not the admissions committee's fault, I would say, in this regard. I would say it's all the people you're competing against. You're just too damn good. So, um, you know, listen, if, if everyone, if they just competed on GMAT scores and resumes and things, and they just took the highest, I mean, and I'm not, I'm kind of joking, but not really, you would have the Wharton classroom full of people from India, right? Um, and, and, and that's it. So, you know, and obviously, I mean, you don't want that, right? I mean, it's like, this is supposed to be a, uh, uh, a diverse, you know, classroom, right? So, so, um, you know, you wouldn't want that as a student, would you, you know, you go over and you're like, Hey, you know, it looks like my undergrad. So what, um, so yeah, so it's not so much the admissions committee. Um, I mean, obviously they are implementing a higher standard and that may seem unfair, but it just look at, you know, who you're competing against. Right. So it's like, they have raised the bar. The admissions committee knows that they have to set the bar that high, right? So what do they, I mean, what would they do, right? Would they start accepting people with 680s from India, right? When everybody else has, you know, comes to the table with a 730, 740. So that's all. Um, okay, so da, 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 da. All right, now, um, all right. So Tammy, hopefully that respectfully answered the question. Okay, so um, Utkar says, Okay, so listen, email me at um, MBA at Amerasia Consulting if you want the slides, right? And I'll, I'll just zip it right out to you, right? Um, I'm probably gonna get quite a few inquiries for this. So if I don't get back to you in the next day, give me a day and a half. All right, um, so hopefully that answers uh, Adkarsh's question, Charudata's, Tata Munde's question, Alberto Cinebaldi, that's an Italian name, like it. Um, Okay, so Amlan, okay, David Wang, here we go. Hey, current Wharton student, just finished first year admissions fellow, not affiliated. Oh, Dave, thank, I just met you, Dave. Thanks for uh, jumping in. All right, so how much GMAT score do you prefer? Um, on a G, on, on Jenny Austin. Okay, listen, um, I'm not gonna make any assumptions about where you may uh, be from or what industry you're coming from, but in general, what I've seen in my own personal experience, by the way, is that if you are from, let's say, India, I'm just using this as an example, I'm not saying you're from India, but if you are from India safely, I would say at Wharton, you want to be about, you you must be above the average, right? I mean, listen, there's always exceptions, right? Um, if in the perfect world, I would say 20, 30 points above the average, which would put you about a 740, 750. Uh, now, have I worked with applicants? Um, from India uh, that are male and female um, that have gotten 720s, 730s and gotten into Wharton. Yeah, it happens, right? Um, usually they'll have some other compensating factor, right? I've worked with a bunch of Bainies, people from BCG, uh, you know, IITNs from whatever, you know, Delhi, Bombay, Camphor, Karajpur, Madras, you get it, right? Um, pretty soon I won't be able to list off all the IITs because they're apparently opening one up every month. Anyway, so um, anyway, so that that's that's what I would say safely. Now, what's the difference between a seven twenty or seven thirty and a seven fifty, seven sixty? Well, basically, three more questions right on the GMAT, right? Um, but what I've seen, and I'm talking about um, applicants from India here as the example, uh, that's where you start to get money from Wharton. And not just a little money. I mean, it, you know, it used to be like 25, 35 grand, but I've seen lately like easily 50 grand. You know, I've even had people 
I mean, not this past year, because it was very competitive this last year, probably the most competitive year ever. But in years past, you know, if people would even get free full rides to Wharton. If you pull in the old 770, 780, and you have a stacked resume, right? Um, you know, they're gonna want, they're gonna want you. Uh, yeah, they're gonna throw money at you um, to try to reel you in. That's okay. P when do you start getting money? By the way, yeah, these admissions committees they'll say it's based on need, you know, need based. Uh, but what I've seen is if you come from, if you have a monster GMAT score, you know, seven fifty plus, and you come from a company or an industry like uh, you know a very hot company or uh, I don't know, you know, whatever. Okay, fine. Bain BCG, because that's the first thing I'm thinking of. But if you're, or if you come from a unicorn, maybe some of these, you know, top tier, you know, MBBs, um, but also um, private equity, venture capital, particularly venture capital in India, um, they're going to start giving you money, right? Um, and a lot of it. Um, but again, you have to have that top GMAT score. All right. So, What's the range of age getting admission in wardens? Okay, so these are some of these things are, um, you know, easily discernible or findable, right, through Google. But you know, we're looking at here. I mean, what do I see? I mean, anywhere from like 24 to 28, right? So what's that? The median maybe 26, average somewhere in there. Um, for guys, it'll be a little older. For women, it'll be slightly younger. Um, and yeah, that. So if you see, by the way, you know, and I don't have the complete data set here. But if you have a, um, it, you know, if you look at the, I would say the distribution of, of students going into a Wharton, right, in any given year, I would imagine the reason why over the last 15 years you see that the average age is creeping down is because they are uh, admitting more women who tend to be younger than guys. Now, you may want to slap me across the face because I, you know, said something that doesn't agree with you regarding gender and who gets in and who doesn't. But what I would say is this, they accept the GRE at top programs because a lot more women take the GRE. A lot more people would take the GRE right after their undergraduate. So in order to attract the top talent, which includes fishing out of a, um, a, a pool that includes many more females, um, they started accepting the GRE, right? And then again, they were getting the they they were getting the top talent out of undergrad before they went off to law school or any other professional program, right? Um, and that's why you see the average age creeping younger. It probably coincides with when they started taking the G the GRE. Anyway, um, but you know what I've seen really. I mean, I have a client this past year. He's about to turn thirty two who got into Wharton, right? Um, after you know failing several years back, but he he got in. So you know um, from Asia. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, listen, I would say once you start creeping up around that age, maybe it's a little too late, unless you have a compelling reason as to why you're two or three years older than everybody else. Like you were in the military, for example, or maybe you were sick or maybe whatever. So you may want to explain that in an optional essay, especially if you're like creeping up to 34, 35. Anyway, Rob DP, thank you so much for the information. You're welcome. Um, so our sing. Apart from the GMAT and GPA, any additional benefit for startup co-founders, specifically $10 million startup, the funding raises through angel investor or venture capitalist. Okay, so I think you're talking kind of specific, like I know a guy who did this, uh, but maybe not necessarily your startup. Anyway, I'm kidding, but here's what I would say here. Um, they like the entrepreneurial experience, right? But it can't be something that you started in your parents' garage necessarily or in the basement. Um, it has to be something that has teeth. And, and as you alluded to here, you referenced here, it has to be something that is, you know, um, backed by a fund, right? Okay, yeah, an angel investor, sure, right? $10 million sounds good, by the way, if that's, you know, whatever round of investing or however many rounds of investing that may be, that's what we're talking about. I mean, you know, even if it was a million bucks, whatever, it just can't be, sure, it may be bootstrapped, but it just, but I haven't seen that work that well, right? Um, because if the idea is so good, if it's a really something worth quitting your job for and pursuing, why didn't you know uh, some VC fund? Why didn't Bloom, right, or whoever else in India, um, you know, kind of this growth stage investors or VC? Why didn't they invest in it? You know, what's up, right? It's, obviously, it's a 
something you're really interested in enough to quit your job and go for it, you know, why didn't other people see it that way? Why didn't you have the resources before this became your full-time gig? Or so that's one of the questions or a few of the questions that they'll ask or worse, the worst question that they could ask themselves when they see something, if it doesn't have dollars or rupees behind it, um, is, is this just some pet project that he or she, the applicants working on that isn't really a business and is just, they're kind of bullshitting, right? So a lot of, you know, kind of questions come up and again, what will those questions be? What drives those questions? Well, basically how is a recruiter going to look at this experience? You know, okay. You know, if, if a recruiter recruited for whatever fund or whatever, you know, entrepreneurial, um, you know, entrepreneurial organization, you know, an Uber, uh, Gojek, or uh, whatever. Um, how are they going to view the startup experience? Will they value it, right? Um, how well will this, you know, gal or guy fit in here? Um, and if it just looks like, you know, you're doing something, pounding out a few widgets in your mom's basement, uh, you know, it's it's not going to be compelling to the admissions committee because it's not going to be compelling to a recruiter. Um, all right, so hopefully our sing answered your question. Rob DP says, when would you recommend we start writing our essays for fall 2022 applications? Okay, so the essays for Wharton, I do not believe, slap me across the face if I'm wrong, they haven't come out yet, right? They will at some point, but I will tell you this, I'm almost certain the first essay, I mean, I will answer your question directly, by the way, Rob, um, in, a mo in a moment here, but, the first essay isn't going to change. It hasn't changed for years at Wharton. How will, you know, it's tweaked slightly, but it's like, what do you hope to gain professionally through the Wharton MBA? Make no mistake about it, Rob, and anybody else on this presentation, that is a freaking goals essay, right? You know, the bottom line, the bottom answer to that question in a nutshell is, I hope to gain the management and leadership skills and I guess network I need to reach my goals. That's what I hope to gain professionally through the Wharton MBA. What comes next? Your goals. In the long term, I hope to save, I hope to bring running water to every village in Canada, right? And then another line about that. As position if, with this firm that brings running water to Canadians, you know, I'm going to do that, right? Then the short-term goal. And again, we're getting into next week's stuff, spoiler, but then a the short-term, in order to reach that long-term goal upon graduation from Wharton, my short-term goal is to, you know, go join the National Hockey League or go join whatever. Um uh, the Gates Foundation or Chai or, you know, whatever. Um, and in this role as a, you know, head of water distribution uh, in, in cold places, you know, I'm going to do X, Y, and Z, right? Again, I totally made up that short-term goal. You want to make sure that <laughs> somebody does that job and that company is hiring from Wharton. All right. Anyway, uh, as you know. So getting back to Rob DP's question at 10.09 a.m., um, when should you start? Okay. Well, um, the questions aren't out yet. You know, the first question is probably going to be the same. Start writing your goals essay, right? Start figuring out what your goals is. And I think after next week, to be honest with you, Rob, you, and I give the presentation next week for the Wharton essays, you should be able to start, right? Um, and depending on your level, your proficiency as a writer uh, and experience as a writer, um, you know, you may, it may take you a couple of months to bang out really good Wharton essays. Now, could you do it? If push came to shove, if the end of the world was coming, could you bang out good Wharton essays and yet all the time in the world in a couple of weeks? I'm sure you could, but it's not likely because of course you have work, you know, you have personal obligations um, and you may want to shop your essay around to people. But even that, you know, maybe you, even if you were finished with good essays in a couple of weeks that you could submit to Wharton, maybe your recommenders aren't, you know, haven't finished their part of the deal, right? So even if you uploaded your essays, nobody's going to take a look at them. Well, nobody would take a look at them anyway, because Wharton's not rolling admissions. So it's just going to sit there anyway. But how long, getting back to your question, I would say if you're just starting out, Wharton's the first school you're attacking, I would give it two months, right? And I think um, every school after that, uh, given, you know, I'd have to see the the individual essays and how much overlap there is would probably take two thirds the amount of time. Now it doesn't mean you have to go in series here. You know, start one of it. You could start up the second school. Um, so after you nail down like the goals essay at Wharton, you know it's like ninety five percent there. Then you could start, let's say, uh, Columbia, which has a similar goals essay. 
uh, you could start working on that, right? What you don't want to do is start Columbia and Wharton at the same time and have like, okay, I made a change over here to the goals. Now I got to go over to Columbia and make the same damn change. It just becomes unwieldy. Mistakes are made. Things get sloppy, but it's just unnecessary work. So I'd say concentrate for the first couple of months you know, first month on getting Wharton to where you know these are the goals and you know even what SA2 may say. And then you can start on the goals essays for even Booth because they have a similar goals essay to, to Wharton and then CBS, right? Um, SA2 for Wharton, which is pretty much, um, you know, community is a core part of the Wharton experience. How will you contribute to our community? Um, and they mean community as in beyond the classroom. They don't want to know how smart you are and you know, big data analysis and spreadsheeting. Uh, they want to know community, clubs, you know, um, conferences, organizations, centers for learning. Um, that is probably going to stay the same. They'll tweak the question, but over the last few years, they've had that question or something similar to it, right? Like they would, they would have like, what do you, where do you plan on making your biggest contribution to Wharton? And then it's like, where do you plan on contributing? And then it evolves, but it'll pretty much be the same. Um, yeah, I think last year's question was a good one. It's a clearer version of a question that they asked for SA2 from two or three years ago, right? Where it was just profoundly confusing the way it was worded because they tried to get all tricky. Um, all right, so you're writing, yeah, so if you're a decent writer, yeah, two months, you know, it, yeah. So anyway, we'll probably be able to answer your question, Rob, better next week, right? Um, okay, Yash Pal. The whole, what do you say are the best resume and essay for applying in deferred MBA? Oh, okay. So you're talking about like Yale Silver Scholars, HBS 2 plus 2. I think Booth has one now. Uh, the, these schools are coming up with every single permutation of MBA program now. So there's a bunch. Um, the best resume. Okay. So the bottom line for applying to a deferred program when you have no work experience, hopefully, You'll have those internships, right? But you have to have a, you have to be chock full of leadership in your undergraduate experience, right? You're in the clubs, you let it, right? You did the first to bring, you know, running water to campus and electricity, first to whatever, right? First to do all these things on campus. It, like you have to be able to look back and say, I left the campus better, measurably better, not just in my opinion, but in, you know, Dean Jones's and G Dean Smith's, uh, you know, opinion, because they're going to be your recommenders. So, if you don't have a lot of work experience, and I know internships can be, you know, significant, you know, you got that sought after internship at Deutsche Bank, yippee, right? But at the end of the day, you know, and even if you were like the best and you, you got an, a return offer and all that jazz, right? Um, just know that they're looking for leadership potential in you at that early age. So yeah, because you're not going to have all your professional work experience or even goals figured out necessarily. You may have a, you know, some direction. You want to sound more certain than not with respect to your goals, but they're looking at that leadership potential. So whatever you get involved in, yes, Paul, you got to own, you got to, you know, dominate. And, uh, you know, I don't mean crushing other people, um, you know, stepping over bodies that you're climbing up to, you know, climbing up and over on your way to the top. What I'm talking about, you know, don't just be a participant, be somebody who was intimately involved, not in everything, but in enough things, you know, two or three leadership experiences, big leadership experiences over your undergraduate where you, um, you know, you, you killed it, right? In a good way. All right, Noam, thanks for all the information. Is venture capital a good post MBA goal for Wharton? No, it's not. Um, no, okay, next question. All right, no, so seriously, um, Mr. Modi, uh, no, it's not. Okay, and I'll, I'll tell you why, I'll tell you why. Listen, I don't know your whole background, so maybe it is, it's great, <clears throat> but, what I would say here is, listen, if, if you want to, if you're already in venture capital, you're working for a bloom, you know, light speed, whatever, in India, not making any assumptions, just saying, um, then you could say that, right? Um, you could say that, you know, you plan to return to your current employer, except the offer that they've extended you is how I would write it if they have, in fact, extended you that offer. Uh, return to India, right? That gives <clears throat> the admissions committee 100% certainty, right? That you know what you're gonna do, you know where you're gonna go, you know you have a the red carpet somehow rolled out for you at your current firm or one that's similar. Um, that's what I've seen work when um, guys or gals have applied from to Wharton going into VC. They've come from VC. Um, 
you could say VC is a long-term goal. That would be more appropriate. So I would talk about going and get, see, I'll, I'll be honest with you. Like, so you're an ex Google data analyst currently BCG. Okay. So I'm very familiar with BCG. I'm assuming again, I'm just going to make an assumption that's in India. I know it's got a meat grinder reputation. I know it's a tougher place to work than Bain India, right? Oh, somebody's going to leave a nasty comment for me, but whatever. All right. So what I would say here is, is you would say, okay, ex data Google analyst, I can see why you went to BCG, but you know, I would say that before you go into venture capital, I mean, look to see who has done that. Again, go back to LinkedIn, who has done that graduating from Wharton? You'll see it's very few and far between. And if they did go, I'm gonna venture to guess that they were already in a VC or had those relationships set up. I mean, even the, the smartest guys and gals at Wharton who want to go in that direction, um, there's only so many, there's only so few opportunities. So you may be that one, you know, four leaf clover or whatever, uh, unicorn, but but um, it's you're going to make the admissions committee nervous. I would say be more appropriate for a longer term goal. So post MBA, I mean, you probably want to get that operations experience, right? Um, or you know, go work for some other type of a fund. Um, and if it gets noisy, ladies and gentlemen, forgive me, but um, there's uh, somebody running one of those whatever outside. So that's uh, be more conservative. Look to see who with your experience. What have they done um, after Wharton? You know, with the BCG experience, you know, I don't know what your project, uh, you know, portfolio kind of looks like, um, but look to see who eventually ended up in VC. What did they do, right? And uh, you know, follow that blueprint. Um, e email me. I, I, I can probably yeah, I have some more thoughts about that to be honest with you. Um, but anyway, don't just the bottom line here, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, don't say you want to get in the VC. It's like, you know, shoving a camel through the eye of a needle. Anyway, uh, all right, Zubin Wilson, do MBA graduates from India struggle with getting a job and continuing it, it because MBA is not a STEM degree? It might, <clears throat> okay, Zubin, this is a very, actually, I don't know if you meant this to be a good question, but it is. And what do I mean by that? You want to apply to a STEM designated MBA program, which Wharton is, right? So you wanna make sure and I should have included this maybe earlier on that whatever variant of the MBA that you have, whatever major, whatever, that it is STEM des designated. So after you're done and you pay off those damn loans, um, you will you know, have three years, I believe, in the US for that optional practical training, whatever it's called. And um, you know, you'll pay it back and chances are you successfully navigate those three years you'll be um, living wherever in the US should you choose to, to do that. So the MBA is a STEM degree. Right? They've caught on to that, uh, the, the administrators have. So I think at almost every major top MBA program now, you'll have that option. Okay, uh, Tapos, what types of extracurricular activities do I prefer? Me personally? Well, long walks on the beach, <laughs> um, finger painting. All right, so seriously, um, you mean what Wharton or the admissions committee likes to see. So honestly, extracurricular activities now as a professional are a bit overrated. In my opinion, this might be controversial. Somebody here may check me. Um, the man from Wharton might, right? Um, I'll just ignore him. But uh, what I would say here is this. Um, the reason why leadership experiences would be important is because, you know, when you're applying, is definitely undergraduate. They want to show that you're involved. You're not just a brainiac. You're not just a test nerd, right? You're well-rounded. You're developing as a leader. <clears throat> but now, you know, extracurriculars should be viewed as a leadership opportunity, right? So now as a professional, yeah, you're working a lot of hours a week. You can't be that involved in stuff, whatever. You work in 80s, 7s. Um, but the real problem is that you should be, the leadership experience that you would be getting from an extracurricular now that you are a professional is really um, something that that you should be getting at work, to be honest with you. So if you lack leadership um, opportunity at work or leadership roles at work, I would tell you, you know, you need to get your butt into some organization, whatever it may be. It may, okay, fuzzy dog, pet rescue. You have to not, you can't be the dog being rescued. You have to be the, um, you know, on the board. Right, of that organization. So whatever it is, you know, you, what, what kind of they prefer, I wouldn't say it's a specific type. Now it should be related to something you're personally interested in, interested in to be honest with you. Um, 
but anyway, so, so anyway, so, um, hopefully that answered your, your question, right? So if, again, there's, there's many aspects is if you're lacking leadership at work right now as a professional, get involved in something. Um, and yeah, and, and be in a leadership position. All right. For some reason I just lost. Okay, here we go. Um, now I'm back. All right. So what do we have here? Um, so yeah, I mean, but don't listen, if you think that leadership extracurricular activities are going to paint you as some very nice guy or gal or some bleeding heart or somebody really cares about whales or seals or, you know, saving the rainforest. Okay. It can help, but you know, why aren't you working for the Gates foundation or the rainforest foundation or whatever, if that's really what's so important to you. Right. So get that kind of demonstrate that passion through your work and your direction. Uh, maybe if it's not necessarily trees, maybe it's, you know, investing in entrepreneurs, whatever it may be. So anyway, um, hopefully I'm clear. We'll go over this next week as well. So hopefully you'll be next week. Ask me the same question. I'll give you a different answer. All right. So, um, Adik, how competitive is it for high range age students with recruitment admissions with manufacturing background and CPA? Okay. So this is a difficult question to answer because I'm assuming you're talking about Wharton, but you know, what are your goals, right? Um, you know, the relative competitiveness is really how well are you aligned with your goals? If you have um, goals that you could easily slide into upon graduation with an MBA from Wharton, because that that firm or that type of firm or that industry recruits from Wharton, then you're good. Uh, and you have that experience more than probably the next, you know, squirrel or mouse or whoever else is applying, then you um, you have that advantage, right? So look on LinkedIn again, see who's hiring, but look to see what the backgrounds of the people who, you know, we're applying. And if you see somebody works at a similar firm uh, to yours, you know, what was their progression? What were their titles? What achievements did they have? What did they work on? Um, and if you're better then I would say you're more competitive than, than that other person to get in, not just to get that job post MBA, but to get into Wharton in the, um, in the first place, right? Now, you, listen, if you're butting up against stage 33, 34, 35, heaven forbid 40, um, then, I would say a full-time MBA program probably isn't the most appropriate for you unless you have a very compelling reason as to why. Um, so, you know, think about this from the admissions committee slash recruiters perspective. You know, do you bring something to the table, more experience, let's say, a certain subject matter expertise within this, this, this area or this industry? Um, and that's it. You know, recruiters start to worry about, and admissions committee is a little bit here, but, you know, how much does, you know, ADIC want to get paid? right? Because it's cheaper to hire. I mean, I'm speaking very pragmatically here. It's cheaper for a po post MBA hiring firm to land somebody who's, you know, 26, 27, 28, even 30 coming out of business school. And it is a lot more expensive to land somebody who's 35 and wants a higher title and, you know, a new Cadillac or Mercedes or whatever, right? Um, all right. So for post MBA going consulting. Okay, great. Now I read that, that part of Part of this um my answer is pretty is the same right so i think i think actually recruiters may like you but you might have to be willing to accept um, a title that's not drastically higher than what you you know you have now right because they tend to these firms consulting they tend to hire in at the same level so i don't think you're going to go in as a senior manager you know if you're a manager now don't think you're going to go in you may have to go in as a <laughs> senior consultant or something right I kid, but um, but don't just know that you're going to get what everybody else gets from you know Wharton graduating, going to MBB, right? McKinsey, Bain, BCG. All right, Rob, you're welcome. Um, Yash Paul, Oki, thanks. Uh, actually, my association with an NGO was from 2011 to 17, and then I moved to a different location and couldn't continue that. Many people advise that volunteering should be recent. Is there any way that I can show? Well, yeah, you'd volunteer for a new organization, one that's probably consistent with the old NGO. So, you know, if you're saving baby seals and join another organization, it doesn't have to be the same one that's saving baby seals or something, you know, saving, maybe it's saving baby whales, whatever it is, but something that demonstrates the same type of commitment to nature, right? Or wildlife, something like that, right? But then again, it goes back to my old point, actually, which is that, you know, what do you, what do you need that experience for? 
or why aren't you working for the World Wildlife Fund now or whoever, right? Or the zoo, you know, if you're into baby seals or baby whales. Um, you should be demonstrating that commitment and leadership through your work, ideally. Now, if you're just volunteering because people say you should volunteer, that's not a good reason, right? You should be spending that time there on leadership initiatives at work and developing your leadership. So leadership for the most part is leadership. You can, I guess, demonstrate it at some outside extracurricular, but my preference and what I've seen work more is get it at work, get that pr promotion, get that bigger project, ask for, pursue, step into that greater leadership responsibility at work because work is where you spend your best time, eight in the morning to you know, four in the evening, no, six, seven, whatever it may be, that's where your best time and effort is spent. They're, they're getting, they're accepting you into Warden because, you know, they're looking for that leadership and business experience. This is a business school, right? Um, not a save the whales. Uh, we're looking for nice guys and gals school. That's kind of icing on the cake a little bit, but they want the, they want the experience, you know, along with the test scores and things like that. So anyway, KN, um, how does Wharton look at family business associate applicants? I mean, my experience favorably, right? They have all those small, you know, family business resources and centers there. Um, you know, it's not, um, there aren't going to be a lot of family business applicants uh, to be honest with you, right? I couldn't give you an exact number or percentage, but when they come along, you know, as long as it's not, you're not running, um, and I'm kind of joking here, but like, you know, a pyramid scheme type thing, you know, and the whole family's in on it. Um, as long as it's legit, you know, it shows revenue and Wharton will ask, they will verify. They listen, a lot of these top business schools do not do a good job of checking your, your, um, you know, your credentials, right? Your rap sheet, but Wharton will, They'll, they're going to dig into it more than any other business school I've seen. Right. And I know from experience anyway, so family business associate applicants, very good. You know, you just, it's, it's almost like it's a kind of a sniper approach, right? You know exactly what you need from the school. You know, there's a family business center. There's this, there's that. You know, there's, I think the great thing about family businesses is that you can legitimately say that, um, you know, there's a lot of internal politics and, and, and uh, you know, rigmarole associated uh, uh, with family businesses, you know, that are very delicate. And you would go on and you would say, you know, so through, you know, interpersonal dynamics, um, whatever type of, you know, touchy feely management class or approach, you know, you would need all that. Right. And then of course, Warden will have specific, I can't think of any off the top of my head, but I know they're there. They will have specific, um, family business oriented, uh, classes. Now, when you go look at that, um, you know, Warden MBA resource guide, hit control F type in family, right? See what comes up. Um, uh, and, and see, you know, see what the description of those classes are and then start Googling for the whole syllabus and look through. All right. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I've, yeah, I, I actually like working with, and this isn't a sales pitch, but I like working with family business associated applicants, right? Their backgrounds are pretty interesting. The businesses are pretty interesting, right? Some of the stories that they tell are interesting. So Wharton will look favorably. And here's the other thing. Remember looking at this whole thing from a recruiter's perspective, I mean, you're obviously going to go back to the family business at some point, either in the short term or long term. So they know, you know, probably in the short term, right? So they know um, your money in the bank, so to speak. They don't have to worry about you. You're going to get the job, right? You're not going to be pissed off that you're three months after graduation, not unemployed, or you can't get the internship that you want. You know, by the way, you can go do an internship wherever. You don't have to go do the family business, you know, go back to the, the you know, the chocolate factory or whatever, you know, the family's into. You can go work for whoever and then come back, right? You can even say after graduation in the short term, I want to go work for whatever, you know, super duper uh, entrepreneurial, you know, tech oriented company that does what my family business does, but, you know, uses tech infrastructure as opposed to post-it notes and, you know, whiteboards uh, and then go back to the family company. Anyway. All right. Um, uh, Taps, I don't know. You asked another question here at 1032 AM, accounting background, eight years experiences, investment bank, long-term goal. I don't, is it logical to make an MBA admission? I would be, um, I would be bullshitting if I could give you that answer. And I would have to kind of look at the, or your resume in the very least, right? And, and think about it. So just email me with your background, include a resume. I'll, I'll take a look and let you know. Yes, Paul. Hey, thanks. Um, great today. How about every day? All right. Thank you very much. Uh, I enjoyed you being in the session. David Wang, in my opinion, the easiest STEM major is to get is the OID. I just need five. Okay, cool. David, by the way, is a current Wharton student, right? So he should know. Thanks for that. Um, 
uh, Nitsha. Uh, let's see, what is the average GPA? Again, this is something that um, I mean, Google is very good at finding. I mean, at Warden, I don't know what it is. David, David would know, right? Um, but I would imagine it's in the probably three, six. But here's the thing. What is the average GPA for your demographic, right? So if you're a nuclear engineering undergrad, hell, maybe a three one is awesome from from you know MIT, right? Maybe not. But if you're an art history major from Brown or wherever, you know maybe you're going to need a three nine. So anyway, um, so that's you know you you'd want to look that up and see, right? But here's the other thing: what is your GPA versus the others that graduated from your undergraduate institution. So if you're like first class or first class with distinction, or you're in the top 10%, and it says that on your transcript, because often these schools, Wharton will ask, you know, what approximate, where did you finish in your class? Yeah, I guess you could say top 10%, but if it's not on your resume, it kind of comes across as bullshit. Plus, they already know. They've seen people from whatever school you may have come from before. Um, so they're going to know, like, that's probably not top 10%, right? You have a, you're a 5.5 at an IIT, right? 5 point nobody or whatever that movie is that I watched. Um, you know, they're going to know you're full of, you know, crap if you say that's top 10%. All right. Um, okay. So what else? Uh, Zubin Wilson, what are your thoughts on the value addition in career and MBA application of uh, CFA? So chartered financial analyst, three levels, FRM. All right. Um, it helps a little, right? Uh, it definitely makes you more attractive to certain types of employers. So if you're going back into finance and you know by looking at hey, LinkedIn that it seems like everybody who assumes this role at this company after graduation from Wharton has a CFA and you already have one, that looks pretty good. Now, you have to keep in mind that a lot of people will get their CFA burning the candle at both ends at Wharton, right? Um, I know it takes 18 months at a minimum, but uh, for those three tests, but you know, just know that the the relative advantage, so it starts to disappear um, because more people will have it, recruiters, but the fact that you have it now, yeah, you know, and knowing that the admissions committee looks at things from more of a recruiter's perspective in this regard, yeah, it, it would help, you know, but not as much as one might think, right? They just need to know. I mean, here's the other thing too. So, so Zubin, look at everybody around you at work, right? You know, hopefully you don't work for a one man band, but look at all the other people working at similar firms, similar positions. Do they have a CFA? Because that's essentially who you're competing against, right? So if they don't, sure, it's a, it's a feather in the cap. I mean, if, if you had a, a, another person, you know, let's just call him a Wilson Zubin, right? You're the bizarro version of you. If they came to the table versus the Zubin Wilson, who you are, um, and everything was the same, you even part, maybe part your hair on a different side of the head, but, and you had a CFA, okay, yeah, you, you would have that advantage. I mean, all things aren't as equal as that, but you have a slight advantage. I don't think, listen, may it get you in off the wait list or something? Maybe, I mean, that's hard for me to, to tell, right? Um, but it would, it would give you a, a little advantage, right? Um, anyway, again, it depends on your goals. It depends on, you know, who else is applying. All right. Yes. Okay. Um, uh, looks like David's getting a date here. Yash Paul V. Hall, 1044 AM. Hey, David Wang, where can I connect to you? All right. Um, Eric Gold, thanks a lot. Okay. So Ashwin says at 1046, how does a higher master's GPA help offset a low bachelor's GPA? Um, it will. It depends on how bad your undergraduate GPA is, but it will. Um, I guess it depends on, it, you know, it, it, it depends on how many years you've been working. I know that sounds weird. The longer you work, the less relevant your undergraduate GPA is. I mean, missions committees look at the GPA, they'll compare it to everything else. They'll know maybe you are younger and dumber and whatever, um, but the graduate will help alleviate that, right? I would explain that in uh, an optional essay as to why your undergraduate undergraduate GPA is lower than the average. I think, you know, your GPA in graduate school plus your work experience, the analytical nature of your work experience would help address that. Um, and that's what you would want to say in your optional essay. And, you know, and the reasons for your 
poor undergraduate, just say it was a maturity issue, lack of prioritization, lack of focus, first time away from school, first beer, whatever, right? Not the first beer part, but just say like, you know, you're much different. The bottom line is you're a much different person now, especially if you've been working for four or five, you know, years, two years even. And that doesn't accurately reflect your, you know, your academic potential. What does is your graduate GPA, right? Um, you know, rest assured, I'm not going to be a analytical grenade for my cluster or my, my learning team at Wharton because I do have an analytical job or a spreadsheet all night and day, right? Anyway, um, all right, so, all right, ladies and gentlemen, um, my time with you is up for this week. Next week and the week after, we'll make it happen again. I um, appreciate your patience with me this, this morning or evening, um, and we'll do it all over. I have to run, in the meantime, with uh, any documents or anything you wanna see or any questions, please, email me mba at amerasiaconsulting.com. In the title of the email, please reference the GMAT uh, club session from today so I know to, to ignore it. No, so I know to pay attention to it. Uh, include a resume or something there. Um, and, uh, you know, and that's it. So anyway, uh, and I'll get back to you, but give me, you know, a day or two um, because I imagine there's going to be a, a little bit of a tidal wave here. Uh, anyway, folks, Please tune in next time. We're going to go deep, deep, deep dive into the depths and the mechanics. And it's going to be very specific about how to write the Wharton essay. It's not going to be some, some high-level um, stuff you can't really use, right? We're going to go pretty much paragraph by paragraph um, with how to structure the essay. You know, details may change, but um, the, the individual, uh, the flow of the ideas will pretty much remain the same. Why? So you can maximize what you want to say in 500 words. Uh, at Warden. All right, folks. Thanks for the you got this um, emoticon. I will see you folks next week. Bye-bye.